All right. Everybody go. Whew. Now we're all ready to go. Well, amen, amen. I was just talking to Marcy to see how she was. So She's not having a good morning, so do keep her in prayer. You know, there's a story told about a little fella. He was getting ready to go to bed in a bad thunderstorm. I mean, it was just horrible out. Lightnings are flashing and the thunders are rolling. His mom went in to put him to bed, and she leaned over to kiss him goodnight. He just in a little whimpery little voice, like every little boy would say, he said, Mom, can you spend the night with me? Fear was just ripping this little fella. She looked down at him, and she kissed him on the forehead, and she said, Son, she says, I can't. She goes, I got to sleep in Daddy's room. The little guy just stared at her for a second. He goes, the big sissy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, many times that's how we look at life. That is many times how we look at life because fear can just destroy us. Fear will take us out of our game, put us down to where we can't function. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been there. I don't like to walk in fear, and I try not to anymore. Um, we all get afraid. Don't get me wrong. We, we live with fear. Sometimes fear is good. It'll, it'll keep you on, on your senses. It'll keep you where you need to be. But at the same time, I know that fear can just take you out so fast that you can't even function. And to me, it's sad to see that. You know, and when we look at fear, it's a place that seems we can never get rid of it. It's always before us because it's for some reason, there's always something in our life that creates such a fear that we don't know how to deal with it. And no matter what that fear is, that fear has an origin. There's something that causes it. It's something that causes it so much that that when we look at it, we just got to figure out the why. And again, I say this, and, and I repeat this quite often, but so many times when we look at fear, we deal with the symptom. We want to look at the one thing that's creating the fear rather than the thing that's actually causing the fear. We look at it as, as something that uh, is an illness or a sickness, and it creates a fear within us. The minute we get a bad report from a doctor, instantly we walk into that fear. Well, should we? And the answer to that is no. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we know that we have a victory through that. But yet so many times we get like old Belshazzar in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 5 and verse 6, Belshazzar got so excited and so fearful in his whole body that literally his body shut down. He lost his ability to function. And he basically, yeah, for a lack of a better word, wet his pants. His loins loosened, and that's exactly what it means. He wet himself. He was so afraid. And he had good right to be because he, he destroyed the things of God. He, he, he just totally destroyed them by his, his ill respect. So when we look at, 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 at fear, we see it in a couple of things. Our greatest defense against fear is this. We must have a deep-seated faith. We must have a deep-seated faith in who our faith rests in. If I know where my faith rests, it gives me not only hope, but it gives me power. It gives me strength. The second thing is, we have to understand what we believe. I think the saddest thing today is that Christians don't have a clue of what they believe. We don't know why we believe. We're just told we're supposed to believe that, and we believe it. I quit doing that a long time ago. I quit doing that because I found out so many people were wrong. So I decided to find out for myself, and I searched the word, finding the answers to truth and finding, do I always get it right? No, I still get it wrong, but I'm still seeking We'd never have all the answers, but we still got to be man enough that when we say, hey, I was wrong to say I was wrong, and then try to straighten that back up. But what, that's what takes the, to being a big man. So when I look at this, I have to realize that these things are important. The third thing is this. I hold security because of what that brings. I have a security in who I am, a security in what I believe, a security in who I believe in. And because of those things, it gives me strength. It gives me hope a living hope that we looked at a couple weeks ago. All these things pile together. And when they all fit and they come as one, then I know that I have victory. And that's what we all want. We desire that victory. I think this is what could lead Paul into his life. You know, sometimes I look at Paul's life and I think, man, how could he do what he did? How could he go through all of those things, all the suffering and all the abuse that Paul went through? How could he do that? How could he keep his mental focus so directed one way to come through that? 
I think one is this scripture here in Romans 8 36 Paul said as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long whose sake Romans us Gentiles he's speaking to us we are counted as sheep for the slaughter nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us man that's where Paul pulled it from Paul said I am counted as a sheep to the slaughter that meant that his life was worth nothing on his own he was invaluable because of the fact that that he was willing to lay his life down for me and you he was willing to lay his life down for the Romans and because of this Paul won strength because in all of that suffering and all the things that Paul went through in his mind deep-seated within his mind was the fact that he was more than a conqueror oh man if that don't build us up there's something wrong with us because I no matter how bad my life looks no matter what I'm going through I am more than a conqueror more than a conqueror never lose sight of that if we lose sight of that that's when we fall if I lose sight of that that's when I become of no effect and I have no value to the kingdom I have to understand that no matter what my life is going through I am a conqueror well how can I believe that because Paul did Paul went through that and believed every bit of it how could he do that he did it even with fear even though Paul faced that same fear every single day he went through it did he ever have fear I know he did he had to have fear we all do we all face that but one thing we learn from Paul because of this verse Paul did not let that fear control him that fear did not control Paul and it did not affect the decisions that Paul was making never make a decision based on fear because if you do you're gonna make the wrong decision you're gonna make the wrong decision if you follow fear and base everything on that one thing we have to come beyond that we have to look beyond the fear and realize that we can pull strength from God now watch what he says uh, I should say the writer of Hebrews some believe some believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews I kind of lean that way but there's nothing concrete enough to say that he did but we look at this who no matter who wrote this the facts the same look at chapter 2 verses 14 through 18 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he Jesus also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham wherefore in all things that behooved him to be made like unto his brethren us that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the Saints for the people verse 18 for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he he is able to secure them that are tempted now, there's a mouthful there there really is and there's so much to dig out of this but we can take for a little while here and begin to just glean from it but when we look at this and we begin to see the facts of it all Paul drew strength from this assurance now, I think that Paul understood this and this is how it could come uh, come forth with victory Paul, Paul drew his faith off the assurance that he possessed in Christ we have an assurance through Jesus and it's right here he gives us the facts of this and what we realize is Paul by this defeated the greatest fears that we could ever face we know that the greatest fear that we will ever face is the fear of death now don't tell me none of you fear that because we all do verbally we want to say we don't I don't fear death I really don't fear death I feel the process of getting there <laughs> I, I don't like that part but I know where I'm going and Paul believed the same thing by Paul believing where he was going it didn't phase Paul with fear he know or knew that Jesus defeated the flesh and the one thing that causes us to die is the flesh that's the whole purpose of this and I'll get to more than that in a minute but when we look at Jesus many people think he just haphazardly went through life he, he just had an easy life he was God incarnate he didn't have to face these things well yes he did he just proved it right here 
This scripture is very bold in its comments about him. We know that through this, Jesus suffered the same thing we did. He says right out, he suffered. Now, if we look at this, we have to note the extent that that word goes. Many times we don't want to see this. We don't want to understand it. But it's interesting if you look this word up in the Greek. If you look it up in the Greek and start doing a search in the Greek, it goes right back to this one place. It goes back to the father of the boy that was a lunatic. They said he's a lunatic. He was demon-possessed. That father suffered that same way. That's the mount this carries. Now, if we've ever had somebody in our family that was going through something so harsh, so uh, life-changing, we literally hurt with them. We hurt with them. So when I see Marcia going through what she's going through, it hurts me with inside because it, it, she's part of me. The same way Julie goes through it with Bud, Dave with, with, with Polly, every one of us. We all can be put our name into that spot because we are going through that same thing. But this is the extent that Jesus suffered. If that man could look at his lunatic son and go crazy in grief and sorrow, this is the same way Jesus felt, and we can relate to that. We can relate to that. How was Jesus suffering? This is a question. I mean, this is a big question. And it's through this, and, and they say it in Hebrews right here, it's through temptations. But Jesus went through the same temptations we go through. Now, we think we're all alone in these things. You're not alone. Jesus went through them just like you. He went through them just like you. Same temptations, the same attacks, the same grief. He went through every one of them. We look at this, and, and, and I don't know about you, but it just blows my mind. I look at Jesus, and he comes to this earth, and he sees his creation. His creation. And he looks at us, and he goes, how they reject me. Every day they reject me. They live in sin. They live in the world. Is it any wonder he walked in grief? Is it any wonder he was a man of sorrows? All he had to do was look around. Man, we look at today and see the world going crazy. I mean literally crazy. Threats of nuclear war every day. I'll shoot a nuke off at you. Well, do it then. You know, quit whining and do it. Let's get it going. But it's all talk. So when we look at this, it's all a manipulation of fear. So if they can keep us afraid, we see that this is what happens. And when we as God's creation walk with that kind of fear, we are suffering because we are not putting our faith in Christ. My faith is in Christ. So no matter what happens, my faith is secured. Now, I'm not worried about these things. So we look at this and see it in the sorrow. The question we have to ask is why did he have to go through it? At least that's the one I ask. Because that hurts. When I look at why Jesus had to go through what he did, every year I try to watch The Passion at Easter. I, I, I hate to say I love that movie because I really don't, but I do it for a reality check. Because I know as bad as it looks in that movie for that uh, fellow that played Jesus, that wasn't all that he went through. The Bible is so clear that every bone looked upon him. Every bone was out of joint. You imagine that? I don't compute. I can't even fathom that. But when I see that, I cry when I watch it. Because he went through all of that for me. For me. And I don't know about you, but that's humbling. But why? Why did he do it? And it's simply for this reason. He wanted to secure them. He wanted to bring them to that place. That place where he could know that he was tempted just like us. He was tempted just like we are. So why, by him going through what he went through, it was for us to be able to have an aid in the process. It was for us to look at him to know that he can help us through the trials because he went through them. We sit there and we look at, at Matthew and the different places where we see Jesus tempted in the wilderness. And we look at that and we think, eh, big deal, he was Jesus. He knew the word forward and backward, he wrote it. Temptation was still the same, still the same. Them are eye-opening if you really study them out, and maybe we will in this next year. But when we begin to look at this, it's interesting for the fact that Jesus now stood through the trials. And if Jesus went through the trials, that tells me that he knows everything I'm going through. So all I got to do is go to him. I believe this is a key uh, statement here. Hebrews 2.17 says, Wherefore in all things 
he behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be made a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of people. Oh, man. That's why Paul drew such great strength from this. He drew great strength from this, and so should we. By knowing the hardships of our life, he becomes the merciful and faithful high priest. Now, that's exciting. That's exciting because this allows Jesus to do one thing. It allows him to act with compassion. It allows him to act with compassion. And not just compassion to the world, but compassion to me. It's personal. It's personal. He shows me that compassion. It's interesting. If you do uh, take a search of this, and I did this, 14 times Jesus shows compassion. Every time I read through the Gospels, and I read the Gospels every single day, I, I read the Gospels. And when I get to certain places, I mark them in a different way so I can make note of them. And this is one. I want to see the times of compassion that Jesus used. And in those passion, times of passion, what was they for? I mean, I love the, the resurrection of Lazarus. I mean, that is humbling. When we look at Jesus, there is no more telling place of his compassion. When he stood there and he began to weep at the grave of Lazarus. Why? He felt the loss of his friend. He knew he died. And he knew he couldn't come until after the third day. Because in Jewish minds, they weren't dead until after the third day. That's why he waited. He waited till that thing was over to where he could literally show them that he's bigger than death. Same way with his own life. He waited to the third day. So when we see this thing, it's pretty impressive of the, the beauty of this. But how deep was this compassion? This is what we got to look at. We have to see the reality of this and how far it reaches. This is what it says, compassion or sympathy. And that's what it means. Compassion is sympathy. It means to have his bowels yearn. I mean, that's, that's deep. That's from deep within. That isn't just, oh, man, I'm sorry for you. I mean, how many times do you tell somebody your problems? Oh, man, I'll pray for you. I'm sorry for you. And that's, a, that's it. Not Jesus. Jesus literally, his bowels yearned. Something deep within him now was hurting. That's compassion he has for you. This isn't just for Lazarus. It's for you. Because he sees what you're going through. He sees what I'm going through. It's that compassion that brings from deep within. And to me, that's exciting because it tells me how far-reaching his love is. It's just not a pity over the struggle. It's just not a feeling. It's something that was deep. Won't you know this verse now? Uh, Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And I've said all I've just said to get to this because this is where we want to be. This is where we have to come to. Because to me, when I look at this, Jesus, from the very beginning of creation, knew that he was going to have to go to that cross. It wasn't something new that happened the minute it came. He didn't sit at, the, at, at Gethsemane and begin to cry out to God because he just found out what he had to do. He knew this from the beginning of time that he was going to have to go through this. And because of this, he was prepared. And because of this, we know the extent that he went through. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? Why would he go through that for me? And this is the true compassion of Jesus right here. Because we could not do it on our own. We carry a sin nature since the fall. And that sin nature keeps us guilty. It keeps us blemished. And there had to be an unblemished sacrifice. And that was Jesus. He was unblemished before man. And there was no other way for us to obtain a victory unless he did what he did. If Jesus would have not went to that cross, we would have no opportunity of salvation. None. Sadly, the world thinks they can do it on their own. Ah, I can be a good person. But that's just works. And works will send you to hell. There's nothing wrong with good works as long as they're sealed in the blood of Christ. If we have the salvation of Jesus, we need those good works to prove our faith. James goes into great detail in that. But what we have to realize is the joy that that brings. But we know because of our fall, we need the victory of Jesus. 
By his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated Satan. Man, I love this part. I love this part. Because as I said last week, I get weary of getting beat up. I, re I really do. I get weary of getting beat up. There's times I'll sit and cry, and I think, oh, God, I don't want getting beat up. He got me again. Give me strength to come through these things that we can have victory. And we all fall to that. And I'm not telling you something that you don't go through. We all go through that. But because of what Christ did, I know I have faith and I have hope. Jesus, by the victory that he won on the cross, now holds the keys to hell and death. Oh, what a blessing that is because he judges righteously. He judges righteously. But notice something here. We need to go to Revelation. Know what he says in, in 118. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold. He said, hey, pay attention. That's the expressing. I am alive forevermore. Oh, man. There is no taking him out. Now watch. And have the keys of hell and death. When he come out of that grave, he snatched them keys on his way out. And these are mine. These are mine. But what we have to understand is the importance of this. Jesus destroyed him, it said in Hebrews. What does it mean? Now, I know for a fact that he's not destroyed because he beats us up every day. He's always there. So what does it mean? Now, watch, because this to me is exciting. The word says here that Jesus destroyed, the meaning that Satan is, it's not that he's destroyed in our mindset. Our mindset said, hey, he's destroyed. He's dead. That's not what he's saying. Read on. It means to be entirely idle or useless. Jesus disarmed him of his power over us. Oh, man. That's good. That is good. That transfers power to us. So when you think you're weak and you think you have no power in Christ, wake up, you do. And it's all because of that act that he did at the power of the resurrection. When he snatched them keys, it gave you power. It gave you the authority. And to me, that's exciting to see. Jesus disarmed him. He stripped him of his power. He stripped him of his power over us. That gives us authority. It gives us power. But most of all, it gives us hope. It gives us the ability to stand when we're afraid. Now, uh, that, that's awesome. But why is it so important? Why is it important? When Jesus defeated Satan, he then took the fear out of death. Now grab this. Grab this. If he took the fear out of death, there's nothing, nothing in the world that creates more fear than that. Because it's of the unknown. We don't know how to act in the unknown. But if Jesus took the fear out of the unknown, there's nothing else to fear. This is why Paul could do what he did. This is how Paul could operate without a fear. Because what can man do to me? If man kills me, I go to be with Jesus. I win. They can't hurt me. This is how Paul and every other Christian, when they stare death in the face, can do it without fear. They can do it without fear. They gain that inner peace. I've told you this before, and I, I, I'm going to tell you again because it just... It really awes me of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We had a supervisor at work. His name was Don. And uh, I never worked with Don that much. I was on second shift when he was on days. And then I went to another department and worked for a different supervisor. But I worked with Don all the time. And uh, he was a crude old boy. He's just a man of the world. But uh, he got cancer. And he basically had a death sentence on his life. There was no hope. He, he was so far gone at that moment. They caught it so late. There was nothing they could do. Well, he ended up getting saved in the hospital. And uh, I'd go up and see him every day. <clears throat> and ended up preaching his funeral. But I was awed in the last days of his life. I was just awed at the peace that he had. And he told me one day, he said, Tony, he said, I'm not afraid now to die. I thought, Yes, yes, you got it, Don. And he had a smile on his face because there was a joy within him at that moment, at that moment, that knowing he's going to be with Jesus. That, that thrills me. 
because I love hearing stories about that because it gives us a blessing and it gives us uh, just the joy of knowing that we are in his hands and there's nothing that can take us out. So when I look at these things, it, it's exciting to me. Notice Hebrews 2.15. It says, And delivered them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, this is the reality of fear. It places us into such a state of bondage that we don't know nothing else. Jesus, when he defeated the enemy, took back the keys. He took back their power, as I've already said. But what that does is release us from the fear. It releases us from the fear of death, that the enemy can no longer hold us in bondage because of that. That's, that's big. That's big. Because so many times we walk in fear, but we don't need to. We have the ability to pull ourselves out of that bondage. If I'm in bondage, my hands are tied. I'm tied. When I was younger, I didn't mind being in tight areas. I used to get into little places. I had to, uh, to weld a, a, a pipe at a power plant one day, and it had to, just to get to the thing, you had to go about 30 feet down a catwalk, crawl down two 30-inch pipes, and get to where you needed to be, and the thing was this far from the ceiling and that far from the back wall, and you had to weld that thing. I couldn't even use my welding helmet. Couldn't get to that. And the only way I could get rods in my, in my holder was to go like this and have two guys out there helping me, one covering me up, one to put the rod in, and then I had to go like this, get ready, and the other guy slid the cardboard that I had taped the, the lens to, and I had to weld that thing like that and have it inspected when it was done. I didn't mind them tight places. But now... I'm older. Uh, I don't like them type places no more. I get all, you get all jitty in there, you know, that. oh, I don't like that. But when we look at the enemy, he took me out of that bondage. I'm no longer in that bondage. I'm free, and I have the freedom to do freely what I need to do. That to me is incredible. It gives me such a joy in life. But sadly, through the blindness of the truth, so many in the world still face that same fear. They're freed if they could just come to Jesus. If they would just come, they would find that freedom in their life because they are then holding themselves in bondage by their own desire. By refusing to come, they will never be set free of the bondage that Jesus wants to give them. The only way the enemy can hold us into that bondage is if we turn that over to him. We have to surrender it. Well, I'm not surrendering it. That's mine. I have freedom in Jesus, and I will walk within that freedom. Jesus says that we are to walk without fear. It's interesting if you do a search in the Bible on this, 62 times in the Word of God it tells us fear not, fear not, fear not. Now, I think that means that something is pretty important. That's something that's pretty important. See how many times he told Joshua, fear not, for I'm with thee. Fear not, Joshua, fear not. And go into battle and take back the land. Man, how we need to listen to that today if we had the ability to walk without fear, to go out into that world and share Jesus. What a difference it would make. Jesus began his addresses to the church in the book of Revelation by giving them this, this assurance. And it's one that we can pull from because those same churches are talked to today. But notice what he says in Revelation 1.17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and I am the last. Oh! Man, it starts and ends with him. It starts and ends with him. And that's what we walk in. We have that ability and that authority. The greatest blessing we have is life. Don't ever miss that. Don't ever miss that. The greatest blessing we have is life. Life is precious and never should be taken lightly. However, when the day comes that God is done with me on this earth and I fulfilled my work here, then I will go home, and I will not fear. I will not fear. I will not fear my next, because I'm excited to see what God has. But I'm not looking forward to that day just yet, because I feel I got work to do here. I love when Paul says, I'm torn to go there or stay here because you need me. Because I think if most people are honest, if they're truly sold out to faith, they're looking forward to that day because the fight here will be over. But yet I know it's not finished, and the fight goes on, and I'll fight it to the end. So it gives us hope. It gives us encouragement. 
Because Jesus told me I'm freed from the penalty, the penalty of sin and death. I'm free. I'm free. Paul says this. Note 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, when we look at this, it's exciting to see because there was no death without sin. There's no death. The thing the law did was point to it. It pointed us to the sin. But we know that it couldn't forgive us of the sin. Only Jesus did. But know what he says here in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. But, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Every time I lead somebody to Christ, I take them to that. Because that's what I've earned. I've earned the right to die and suffer my penalty. But by the grace of God, he paid my penalty. He paid my penalty. And to me, that's exciting. Our sin makes us worthy of that penalty. But by the coming to this earth and suffering through the flesh, Jesus beat that in victory. He gives us that victory. He knowing by his earthly struggles knows what we go through. That brings me peace. He knows my grief. He knows my sorrow. He knows the pain I suffer. He knows the things I fight each day. And that brings me a glorious hope. Glorious hope. And I hope it does you. Paul gave these words to the Galatian people. He said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Stand. Take your place. Plant your feet. And take your stance. Watch what he says. And be not entangled again with the, bond, with the yoke of bondage. What does it mean? He doesn't want us walking in that yoke of fear. He doesn't want us walking in that yoke. Now, I know this is speaking of the law. I know that. You can study the whole book of Galatians, and that's what it talks about, the law being the schoolmaster. But when I look at this, I can also apply it to my own life, knowing that I'm freed from that yoke of bondage. If I walk in sin, it's because I choose to walk in sin. If I want to walk in fear, I choose to walk in fear. I make those choices on my own. We must come to a place where we never allow fear to beat us down. I said this before, and I'll say it again. What impresses me so much with the book of Job is this. Job made a statement in there that, that probably 25 years ago I seen this. I was going through a really, really hard time. And, and God really opened my eyes to this. Job said, that thing which I have feared has come to be. That day forward, I said, I'll never fear nothing again. I'll fear, never fear nothing again. Because I had something I feared, and I knew it. And I knew it. And it was taken away. And it happened exactly what I was afraid of. Exactly. And I said then, I'll fear nothing again. I'll fear nothing again. Not to that magnitude. You still fear, but not like that. Because the devil will use that in our life. He will use it against you. And he will create such a fear and a hardship in your life that he will desire nothing more than to steal your blessings. I don't want to go that route. Whatever the origin, origin of that fear is, you need to take it out and lay it before the Lord. There's a story told about a woman. <clears throat> her and her little uh, girl was walking down a, a, a river bank, kind of on a ledge. And they were walking along, and all of a sudden, the little girl slipped into water. Well, the mom, she just panicked. She didn't know what to do. She's screaming bloody murder because of the fact that she did not know how to swim and couldn't get in to save her baby. She's late in the, years, uh, in the months of pregnancy, ready to deliver. So between not knowing how to swim and in that condition, she couldn't get in the water. So she's screaming and screaming and screaming. And all of a sudden, there were some guys hurt her and come running. They jumped in the water and come to find out the water was only waist deep. But by the time they got, by the time they got to the baby, it was already dead. It was already dead. All that lady had to do was push her fear away and get in the water. And she could have saved her baby. How many go through life that same way? 
They could save their life. They could save those around them if they'd quit walking in the fear, the thing that they're so afraid of. The waters of life or the chaos of fear will defeat us. They will beat us down to where we begin to believe the tactics, tactics that the devil are trying to, uh, to take at us. And if we allow them, they'll defeat us, and they will beat us down to steal the joy of our salvation. And that is where we do not want to be. We need to come above that. We come above that by fixing our eyes on Jesus. We put ourselves into that place where I've, my eyes are fixed and they will not move and hold me to faith. Years ago, <clears throat> I was preaching. I was pastoring in Bowling Green. And I was preaching on the eyes of Jesus. And I kept saying, look into the eyes of Jesus. Look into the eyes of Jesus. And these people were visiting the church and there was a little kid. They sat right in the front row. This little kid about four or five years old. And I just kept going like that. You know, every time in a message, I probably did it every five minutes, you know, because I was really trying to stress the point. <laughs> and this little kid, all of a sudden, he's watching me, and I'm getting this dumb little look in his face because I could see. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with that? What's that boy about to do? <laughs> and he all of a sudden, I said it again, and he turned around, and he looked. <laughs> he was trying to find what I was looking at into the eyes of Jesus. And I thought, oh, man, if we could just be like that kid and be so curious to look into them eyes. But that's what we need to do. We need to come to that place because if we don't, fear will steal our joy. I close with this verse. Romans 8, 15. For ye have not received the gift of bondage again to fear. That goes right back to what we're talking about with the devil held over us. He's talking about the fear of death. The spirit of bondage again to fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Ah, oh, man, no matter what we're going through in life, I can cry out before it because I'm with him. He's with me. This week, I've really, I've really been thinking about a lot of things. And I don't even know how to word this because I still haven't figured it out. But I know that there's one thing about claiming the name of Jesus. Because that man has been rolling around like a pea in that big old little brain of mine. Kind of vast emptiness, I should say. But I thought to myself, what is the key to all that? What is the key? The Holy Spirit laid this on my heart. He says, it's friendship. It's friendship. I thought to myself, I don't have too many friends. I mean, I got people here, that's family. But friends are hard to find. I always said I'd never have another friend because they hurt me every time I had one. But that's not good to say either. But I have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I have a friend. I was praying one day and just started getting these crazy thoughts in my head. Just thinking on this. Sometimes that's how you do it. You just let your mind go crazy. And I'm thinking about that, and I thought, man, God, I wonder what you look at. Do you see me with Jesus and look like David and Jonathan coming together and say, yes, let's go serve God. Let's go do this. You know, all in the name of God. And I thought, oh, man, I want to walk like that. I want to walk like that. Because when I'm in that spot, I'm freed of all the bondage of the enemy, of the world, of myself, because I'm so close to Jesus. He's my friend. He's my friend. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, how many times it just brings us to our knees, brings us to a place where we can just humbly cry out to you. Father, in laughter and tears, no matter how we come, I ask, Father, that you would be with us, that we could have such a deep, grounded faith that nothing would move us. Nothing would move us. By what we see today in the supremacy of Jesus, we know that he defeated death. He defeated the penalty of it. He defeated the fear, giving me the opportunity to walk with a boldness but most of all, a relationship. And I ask, Father, 
that you would be with each one here. Father, that you would move in their life. Father, if they've never surrendered themselves to salvation in Jesus, that they would seal that and deal with that, knowing that through that we have the blessings of having that fear removed. But I pray for all of us here, Father, that we would seek you with a greater hunger. Father, that we would seek and hunger after you, that we could walk with the reality of Jesus being our greatest friend, knowing that nothing would separate us, not even death. Oh, Father, we thank you, and we praise you. Father, we do pray for those who couldn't be with us this morning. Father, there's many hearts that are hurt. And I pray, Father, that you would touch each one. Father, people are going through things that you have compassion on. And we pray, Father, that you could look on each one with that compassion, that healing would come through their bodies. And, Father, that you would move in such a mighty way that your Holy Spirit would just do your work. That we could give you the glory and the honor for whatever has taken place. Father, we love you this morning. We just thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen.